Okay, turn to Psalm 119 today. Psalm 119. And we're going to read verses 41 and 42. Psalm 119, verses 41 and 42. Mm -hmm. I love to read Psalm 119. It talks about the Word of God. And reading in Psalm 119, verse 41, Let thy mercies come also unto me, O Lord, even thy salvation according to thy word. So shall I have wherewith to answer him that reproacheth me, for I trust in thy word. Father, we thank you for your grace and love, and we're thankful for the written word of God. And we're thankful, Lord, for what you've done for us and for your Son who died on the cross of Calvary that we can have everlasting life. With the opportunity to gather today for the saints that listen on the web internet, we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Looking at Psalm 119, verse 42, the last part of that verse, For I trust in thy word. What I'd like to do today, dispensationally, uh, I want to share with you our hope is in God's word to us. And that, that's the theme of the lesson. It's on the board. Our hope is in God's Word to us. And thinking along that line, Psalm 119, verse 42, For I trust in thy word. Now we've learned from the Apostle Paul what trusting is. You read Romans through Philemon. And when you trust, you believe. And when you believe, you're fully persuaded. And when you're being fully persuaded, after you learn how to use the Word of God, and you learn how to, the only way you can do that is by rightly dividing the Word of Truth. And when you read and study and build up that doctrine in your inner man, in the details of your life, as you apply the doctrine in the details of your life, you're growing, that's maturity. You're maturing based on who you are in Christ. So keep all that in your mind as we go forward now. Our hope is in God's Word to us. Look in Psalm 68 and verse 11. Psalm 68 and verse 11. By reminding yourself about, for I trust in thy word, Psalm 68 and 11. This will clear it up a lot, well, it clears it all up for me about who gave, who gave the word. And you look in Psalm 68 and 11. The Lord gave the word. Great was the company of those that published it. So I trust in the word, uh, in thy word, because the Lord gave the word. And you know what we know about the Lord? Turn to Hebrews 6.18. Hold your place in Psalms. Psalm and turn to Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 18. Hebrews 6.18. I trust in, in thy word, and I know the Lord gave it the word, his word. Well, look, what do we know about the Lord in Hebrews 6, 18? That by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon this, the hope set before us. Now, you notice the phrase there, it was impossible for God to lie. So, I trust in the Word of God. The Lord gave the Word, His Word, and it's impossible for God to lie. So when I read the Word of God, I know it's God's Word. And going back now to Psalm 118, put this to, with that, Psalm 118, and look at verse 8. Psalm 118 and verse 8. Thinking along these lines, for I trust in thy Word, the Lord gave, the, gave His Word, and the Lord cannot lie. Well, in Psalm 118.8, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Now, that's a big verse right there when you read that. How much, how much that leads to this question. You read that verse there, Psalm 118.8, it's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Well, how much should I trust the Lord? Go to Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. And look at verse 5. And this will tell us how much that we should trust the Lord. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5. 
In verse 5 it says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. There's your inner man there. And lean not unto thine own understanding. You trust Him with all thine heart. And you know what? What did we do to be saved? We had to hear the gospel. We won't turn to it. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. That Christ died for our sins, that He was buried, He was raised again. That's the gospel. The moment we believe the gospel, that's the moment we were saved. Ephesians 1, 13 is another one we know. We're talking about trusted. Well, the word trusted there in Ephesians 1, 13 is defined in that verse. Mm. And it means believe. When you trust something, you believe. And going along that line, in 1 Corinthians 1, 21, it, it pleased God of the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. The only way you can be saved is by believing. And you can tie those, word, those verses together in your notes there. You have them in front of you. So, saying that, go back to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. You know, to kind of summarize what I've said, if you're turning to Psalm 119, uh, I, I've said this, For I trust in thy word. Well, who gave the word? The Lord gave his word. And he cannot lie. And we know trust is believing. You're fully persuaded. And you notice in Psalm 119, look in verse 114. Psalm 119, 114. Thou art my hiding place and my shield. I hope in thy word. And we learn about the hope. That's that confidence that we have. That confident expectation. We're looking, for example, for that blessed hope in Titus chapter 2 there. Well, it's a confident expectation. We're not just hoping it's going to happen. It, it's going to happen. So notice that I hope in thy word. Well, what I want to do today, I'm going to give you seven things about trusting God's word. These seven things I can tell you that I have learned in my life since I've been saved. And did I learn them all at once? No. I'm still learning. But these seven things I'm, again, I'm learning more and more about in my life. And I want to give you these seven things today about trusting the Word of God. And I've got them on the board for the ones that look on the internet or on the video. The first thing about trusting God's Word, I've learned this, that it's complete. The Bible is complete. And I can say that by reading, turn to Colossians chapter 1, and we'll read the verse and not spend time on it because we've got a lot of verses. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 25 I can trust in the Word of God, God's Word, He gave it. I can trust it because it, it's complete. And you'll find in Colossians 1, 25, Colossians chapter 1, verse 25, Whereof I am made a minister. Talking about Paul, according to the dispensation of God, which was given me for you, to fulfill the Word of God. Now notice that, to fulfill it. Well, it's interesting to see that word fulfilled. Paul used it right there, but the first time it's used is in Genesis 29. So turn over there. Paul said he fulfilled the word of God. Well, look at Genesis 29, and look at the first time the word fulfilled is used in the Bible. Genesis chapter 29, and look at verse 27. You can read the chapter... It talks about Jacob, and he had he worked for Rachel. Laban tricked him and gave him Leah, and he had to work extra for Rachel again. And this is what we're talking about in Genesis 29, 27. Notice in verse 26, Genesis 29, 26. And Laban said, It must not be so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Fulfill her weak. And we will give thee this also for the service which I shall serve with me yet seven other years. So we know there, a week there was seven years. And look at verse 28. And Jacob did so and fulfilled her week. And he gave him Rachel, uh, his daughter, to wife also. But in verse 27, fulfilled her week, there's the first time it's used. So how long was, it? was a week then? It was seven years. And that's how long a week was. Fulfill, when you fulfill something, in verse 28, notice it says, And Jacob did so and fulfilled her week, 
And he gave him Rachel, his daughter to wife also. So if he, if he fulfilled the week, would you say he completed the week? That's exactly what he did. He, he completed the week. Well, we have a complete Bible. It's complete. All the way from Genesis to Revelation. There's no more to be added. None to be taken away from or added to. We have a complete Bible. And that's why God's given us His Word in written form. Now, there's reasons for that. And I'm not going to discuss all the reasons. You get into Revelation and Preservation and all. But what I'm going to give you this, this one to go along with the flow of this lesson. The reason, one, the, the reason he gave the written word, one focus, we ought to focus on this reason. It makes every one of us responsible. That's, we have a written Bible. It's complete. And that makes me responsible. That makes you responsible. We have a complete Bible to read, to study. And you know the bottom line is, our choice, it's up to us to do that. We make the choice. So, I want to give you that as an example there. You think about an example, though, and just keep this in your notes there in John 19, 30. What happened? What was Jesus' situation was the Lord Jesus Christ in at that time? He is on the cross. He is dying for the sins of our sins, for the sins of the world. And what did He say in John 19, 30? He said, it's finished. Well, if it's finished, would it be complete? And he, what he did, he completed what God the Father uh, sent him to do. He finished it. And he, God the Father was completely satisfied with the, the propitiation. That's the justice of God. He is completely satisfied with what the, what the Lord Jesus Christ did. So he's complete. He completed on the cross. What as time passed, well, what about but now? Think about complete. Go to Colossians chapter 2 for an example. Colossians chapter 2. And look at us. In Colossians chapter 2. And we're going to read verse 10. And all of us here know, uh, should know Colossians 2.10. And we do. Well, think, think along this line. We've got uh, seven things about trusting the Word of God. One is complete. And you think about what Jesus Christ did on the cross. It's finished. It's complete. You think about now, before, before, let me back up a little bit, but after he died on the cross, his death, bro, and ascension, he ascends up into heaven. Where's he at today? He's sitting at the right hand of the Father, but what did he do? He saved Saul in Acts 7. I'm sorry, he saved Saul in Acts 9, changed his name to Paul, gave the revelation of the mystery, and that's where we're at today. So I'm getting you up to where we're at. We're in the dispensation of grace. Well, I'll speak it, think it along that line, Colossians 2.10, notice it says, and you are complete in Him. Well, who's Him? That's the Lord Jesus Christ. How did you get complete in Him? When you believe the Gospel. Well, what's the Gospel? Christ died for our sins, and that He was buried, He was raised again. The moment we believe that, we were fully persuaded, we believe that, we were saved. So, you were saved, and what's the Word of God say? And you're complete in Him. Well, if you're complete in Him, it's finished. And there's nothing else. What, what else can you do to be saved? It's finished. It's complete. And that's, that's a, a way I want you to think about. And like you said there in Colossians 2.10, and ye are. That's present tense. That's now. Complete in Him. That means the moment that I believe the gospel, I was justified just like you. I was declared righteous. I'm complete in Him. And I'm dead to sin. And that's why when you go back and read Romans, for example, we won't turn for time. Our position in Christ is titled dead to sin. If you want to know what our title is, hey, we're dead to sin, Romans 6, 2. And you can praise the Lord for that. Also, we're dead to the law, Romans 7, 4. Dead to it. We're not under the law, we're under grace. That's Romans 6, 14. For you're not under the law, you're under grace. Well, I think thinking along that line, go to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. And look at verse 16. I mean, we're dead to sin. We're dead to the law. We're not under the law. You're under grace. 
But look at Galatians 5, 16. We're going to read 16 and 18. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit. So let me stop there before we go on. Once you're saved, then you've got to walk. We're in a walk. I'm walking today based on who I am in Christ. You are too. So he says, Paul tells the Galatians, he says, this I say then, walk in the Spirit. When that, that means that in the Spirit, that means walk in line with what God says He's doing today. Well, what's God doing today? He's forming the body of Christ. Uh, who's He using to do that? The Apostle Paul, Romans 2, Philemon. So we're following that, in that line, that body of doctrine. And we're walking in the Spirit. And, you, and if you walk in the Spirit, notice that this is saying then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We still got this flesh. We were made up of the Spirit, soul, and body. If you don't walk in the Spirit, what are you walking in? The flesh. Well, look at verse 18. But if you be led of the Spirit, notice that, you're not under the law. So what if you're not walking in the Spirit? What if you're not led in the Spirit? What are you doing? You're, un you're, you're under the law. That's what you're doing. You're walking in the law. What are you, how are you walking? Body, soul, and spirit. Flesh. And we've all been down that road. Before we came to the knowledge of the truth, we thought we were serving the Lord and living for Him, but yet we weren't filled with the Spirit. We were walking that flesh. And when you walk in that flesh, it's body, soul, and spirit. That's the way we walk. And didn't even know it. That is a sad thing. So, you know, what if you don't walk in the Spirit? Well, verse, verse 16 says again, you, you shall not, if you walk in the Spirit, you, you don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. So, you know, you think about Romans 8, I'm dead to the flesh. So, why serve this flesh? I'm dead to sin like you. We're dead to the law. We're dead to the flesh. So why would we want to serve the flesh and let the flesh take over? You know the flesh has emotions. And if you let those emotions go, I mean it just leads you around your spirit and soul. It drives you around. And you're just like, you're, where am I at? You're lost. You're, not, you're saved, but as far as knowing the will of God and doing what God's will is, you're not doing that. So, you know, being complete, past, Jesus died on the cross, it's finished. You know, now for us, we're saved, we're, we're complete, it's finished. Why would I want to try to seek after the things that I used to try to seek after before I came to the knowledge of the truth? You just think about that. When you first got saved, your journey, how it's been, and how you've been misled. Why were you misled? Because you allowed people human viewpoint to tell you what to do. And, and we didn't search the scriptures ourselves. So you think about being complete, then you go over there in, in, in Revelation chapter 20, we will turn, verse 5, talks about, about the thousand years were finished. Well, Satan's going to be bound there in that thousand years, and then once he's, the thousand years are finished or complete, what's happening? Satan gets let loose, and you, you know all that, and we won't get into that. So I'm giving you past, present, and future about finished, about complete, and how it works together. You know, we're made up of spirit, soul, and body. There's three. And so let trust in the Word of God. It's a, we have a complete Bible. Number two, uh, put on the board, it works quickly. With a, with a complete Bible. If you know how to rightly divide the Word of Truth, if, if you, you're coming to the knowledge of the truth, you realize that Paul is your apostle. He's your spokesperson. He writes Romans 2, Philemon. You write the divine word. You're following Paul. You read the whole Bible. But Romans 2, Philemon is to you. The word of God works quickly. And that's why we'll go back to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. And look at verse 12. There's a phrase there. I know we looked at the verse maybe the last week or so. But you need to get this verse really in your mind. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. 12. I was going to read 1 Thessalonians 2 13, talks about believing, but we're going to come to it. Uh, I just say, I'm saved, I believe the Word of God, so I get to Hebrews 4 12, I know how to write and divide the Bible. Hebrews 4 12, 
For notice this, the Word of God. Just stop right there, that phrase there, the Word of God. Well, what do we have here? We have the written Word in our hands today. I'm using the Bible. It's the written Word of God, and it's called the Word of God. Well, what do you have at the second coming when the Lord comes back, the body of Christ, we're going to be gone, and the Lord Jesus Christ comes back to the second coming and set the kingdom up. Uh, he's riding on that white horse. You know what he's called? He's called the Word of God. That's Revelation 19, 13. So you got the written Word and you got the living Word. But we have the written Word written out for us. And there's something about the written Word there, that word quick, we've used it here, and we're learning, it's alive, it's living, but it's also fast. It works in your life. It changes. you. So, I'm going to say this to you from me. This is my, from me. I'll use myself. Whenever I, I, I was saved, I believe the Word of God, I believe that Christ died for my sins was buried and raised again. When I believe that, then later on in life, I came to some more truth in the Bible, and I believe that. And then later on, I came to some more truth about eternal glory, and that's when the light came on, and I saw what Israel's position would be and what the body of Christ would be. We're heavenly, the body of Christ. And I saw that, and the light came on, and, it worked, and the Word worked fast in me. And the reason it worked fast in me is because I believed. I decided that I'm going to quit following the human viewpoint. I'm not going to follow a man, but I'm going to read the Word of God and believe what it says. And whenever I started doing that, then it quickly started changing my, me, me and man or man. My thinking was completely different. And I know it has for you too. So I'll leave that with you there. About seven things about trusting the Word of God. It's complete. It works quickly. And the third thing it does, it motivates. I found out that Whenever I put the truth in me, it will motivate me to do. Now turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and look at verse 14. About the motivation. 2 Corinthians 5, 14. In verse 14, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge. Well, before I read the rest of the verse, when you judge, it's a thinking process. You're using your mind to judge. So, read the verse again. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge, that if one died for all, then we're all dead. Notice that. Verse 15, And that he died for all, that they which live, uh, well, who would the living, who would, they, that they which live, that would be the saved, that's us. That they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but live unto him which died for them and rose again. So you're talking about living. And you know that, you can connect that, you can write down Philippians 121 in your notes. You don't have to turn to it. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's what the verse says. Philippians 121. You know, living. Uh, that motiva the motivation is that I realize that the Christ, uh, in, in 2 Corinthians 5 14, for the love of Christ constraineth us. You know, that will press you and push you on in. You think about how much the Lord loves us. You think about, I, get, I got up this morning thinking about how much the Father loves me. And how much his son loved me, he died for me, and now I'm an ambassador for Christ, just like you are. How much God the Holy Spirit loves us, he's in us, sealed us, teaching us. As long as we're willing, he'll teach us 24 hours a day if, you're, if we're willing. And that's a wonderful thing to know. And you, you think about all that, and it comes down to this. Go back to 1 Thessalonians 2, 13. That's what I was going to read a while ago, and I told you I was going to wait. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and look at mm -hmm. verse 13. Mm -hmm. In 1 Thessalonians 2, 13, Paul's writing to the church of Thessalonica, and he says this in 1 Thessalonians 2, 13, For this cause I also thank with God without ceasing, because when you receive the Word of God, there it is again, the Word of God, which you heard of us, 
ye received it not as the word of men. The word of man would be human viewpoint. They didn't receive it that way. They did. They received it as the word of God. Uh, but as is in truth, the word of God, which effects and worketh also in you that believe. And now, how does the God? How does the word of God work when you believe it? And where does it work? In the verse tells you, in you worketh in you. There also in you that believe. But you got to believe it before it's going to work. And that's, and that's why I'm, uh, I read all that to start with in the Psalms over there. It's, it's just like we're making a transition going from time past but now. It's where we're at now. If you think about the Word of God, it'll work in us when we believe it. So, I've said this. That the Word of God, I trust it because it's complete. It works quickly. And it motivates you. And you know, when you believe the Word of God, it's going to work, uh, motivate you. That's why I'm you can ask yourself, where does the Word of God work? And we all know that. 1 Thessalonians 2.13, it works in you. And you can add Philippians 2.13 with that. Philippians 2.13. And you, might, you can also add Ephesians 3.16 with that. So, the Word of God works in us. And that, that's, you th think about Philippians 2.13 and Ephesians 3.16. So, as we go on now to the fourth thing about trust, about trust in the Word of God in my life since I've been saved it gives comfort. Now all of us need comfort from well, some time or another. There's going to be a time in your life that you're going to need comfort. Whether it's your, when you're sick or your spouse is sick or your children are sick death in the family that you're going to need comfort. I remember when we lost our son uh, we needed comfort. Well, the Word of God gives comfort. And uh, turn to Romans 15, 4. Romans chapter 15, and look at verse 4. Romans 15, 4. And notice what it says in Romans 15, 4. Paul says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime, I'm sorry, for whatsoever things were written aforetime, were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Notice that's Romans 15, 4. It talks about the comfort of, of the Scriptures. It didn't say comfort in man, even though man can't help you if they've gone through some of the same experience. They can help give you some comfort by giving Scripture too as well. But the Word is what gives you comfort. And the Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1 now. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 on using comfort. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and look in verse 4. 2 Corinthians 1 4. 1 3. 2 Corinthians 1 3. We're talking about comfort, and God's Word gives us comfort. 2 Corinthians 1 4. 1 3. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies. And the God of all comfort. Notice that. He's the God of all comfort. Who comforteth us in all our tribulation. That we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble. By the comfort which we ourselves are comforted of God. Now notice what he's the God of all comfort in verse 3. But also in verse 4. Who comforted us in all our tribulation. Whenever you have trouble. You have tribulation. You have trouble. Who's the one that you want to give you comfort? God. How's He going to do that? In, in His Word. Because we trust in His Word. Uh, that's, that leads to this question. How do we comfort other people? I can tell you about the experience that I've had if, if you're going through the same thing. But the real comfort that I'm going to give you, help you to have, is giving you Scripture and giving you comfort that way. Here's an example. Turn to 1 Thessalonians 4.18. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And look at verse 18. Talk about meeting the Lord in the air. We call it the rapture. Second Thessalonians talks about our gathering. Look in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 there. And verse 18. Wherefore comfort one another with these words. That's the comfort in the Word of God. 
And that, that's what we all know here and realize that the real comfort comes from God. He's a God of all comfort. And He's going to give you comfort uh, from His Word. Am I going too fast for you, right? Okay. That leads to the fifth, fifth uh, mm -hmm. uh, thing about trusting in God's Word. The Word of God, I found out by trusting God's Word, it gives strength. That's the fifth thing. thing. It gives strength. And you know what? I remember when I was lost, and Romans 5, 6 says, you can write it down, we didn't have any strength as a lost person. Romans 5, 6. But <clears throat> since I've been saved, and you're saved, turn to Ephesians chapter 3, and verse 16, we'll read the verse. Ephesians 3, 16. So I know this, that the Word of God, by trusting it, I get strength from God's Word. Ephesians 3.16, Paul says that he, he, the Father, would grant you according to the riches of His glory to be strengthened with might, how? By His Spirit in the inner man. And that, that's the strength that I have and you have. Whenever we put the Word of God in, in our inner man, so whenever you think about strength, strengthen with might, there's the thing about the power. The Holy Spirit energizing the doctrine of the, of the Word in our soul. When you put the Word in your soul, down in your inner man, the Holy Spirit energizes that doctrine in you. And you know what the Holy Spirit does? It dominates our life with the Word of God when you put it in. You know, I, I, people are always saying, I'm not going to allow anything to dominate my life. You know what I want to dominate my life? Is the Word of God through the Holy Spirit. That's what I want. I want the Holy Spirit to have complete control of me through God's Word, through His Word. So that's the strength. And, and the fifth, the sixth thing that we're going to look at about the Word of God, it edifies. And you know what edifies means? Edify means to build up. It's like building a house. For the ones that are listening on the internet. It's like building a house. You have the foundation, the framework, the roof on it. And you, you and the word of God edifies and builds you up. And that's what Romans through Philemon does. When Paul gives these letters to us and we follow Paul, we're building a house of doctrine in our inner man. That the Romans is, is a crossword. It tells us about Jesus Christ dying for us and how we can be saved. And that's the foundation. And you can add to that 1st, 2nd Corinthians and Galatians for the foundation. Then you build that, frame it up with Ephesians that we're heavenly people. And that goes right along with Philippians and Colossians. Put the roof on it and you've got 1st, 2nd Thessalonians that the Lord's coming back for us. We're going to meet Him in the air. So that, that, that's the edification there. Uh, and these are, epistles are designed for that. And that's what's called godly edifying. And we want that. We want the God likeness. We want to be able to think like Christ thinks. Have the mind of Christ, what Paul talked about, I believe it's in Philippians. So by saying that, what's, what does that result in? I've said a lot about all that, that right there. What's it result in? It results in your edification, true spiritual establishment and maturity. You get established in the faith. You become mature. And that's what we want. And we're going to continue to grow as, as mature adults. And we, we, we never get enough of the Word. And we always want the Holy Spirit teaching us and generating, motivating in us uh, the, the sound doctrine. So, go to 2 Timothy now, uh, chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Pastoral epistle, and you read this in 2 Timothy 1, 13. And notice what Paul is going to say to Timothy. In 2 Timothy 1, 13. It's verse, first two words, hold fast. Well, what do you do when you hold fast? You, you don't turn it loose. I mean... We, we, we know what that, you can relate to that. When you hold fast, you don't turn it loose. 
And it says, hold fast a form of sound words. Well, what's the sound words? That's sound doctrine. Hold fast, don't turn loose, sound words, sound doctrine. Very important for us to see that. Uh, which, which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Then look at verse 14, that good thing. Notice that phrase, that good thing. Well, what good thing is he talking about? The body of doctrine given, given to Paul. Paul's got the doctrine. That good thing which was committed unto, me, unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. Paul got that body of doctrine, that good thing. Notice that in verse 14, the word keep. Now that, what are you going to keep? You're going to keep that house of doctrine that was committed to given to Paul to give to you. To give to us, Romans 2, 4, 5, 11. And we keep that. We hold to that. And you know, it's sad that people go backwards a lot of times in their life as believers. And they don't keep it. They don't hold to it. Go back to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Look at verses 3 and 4. Well, let's read just read verse 4. Save time. 1 Timothy 1, 4. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies. Well, what's fables? It's just stories. You know, we've all heard our share of stories in churches before. Uh, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions. Rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. There's the godly edifying. There's that house of doctrine. That's that edifice. Build up that doctrine in our inner man. So, you know, when you, you trust the Word of God, I hold these for the ones who are listening on the internet. First of all, when you trust the Word of God, it's complete. Number two, it works quickly. It motivates. It's number three. Number four, it gives comfort. Five, it gives strength. Six, it edifies. It builds up. And the last one is, is it gives hope. That's what, the, that's what the Word of God does when you trust it. It gives hope. We read about hope in the Psalms, but turn to 1 Corinthians 15 to start with. 1 Corinthians 15. Let me ask you, you know, I, I can say this, I'm thankful that my hope is not in this life only. Now you think about that. I'm thankful that my life's not in this life only. And now, we'll go to 1 Corinthians 15. You know those believers over there, they had some issues, quite a few issues. Divine viewpoint, or human viewpoint was one of their issues. Mm -hmm. But look what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, and look at verse 19. 15, 19. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we're of all men most miserable. Now you think about that. If that's all you got, that hope in this life, you're miserable. Well, you know what? Miserable, you think about it. If that's the only hope that I've got, you know what I'm walking? I'm walking body, soul, spirit. So you can understand why people are miserable. They're walking body, soul, and spirit. They're not walking spirit, soul, and body. When you're walking spirit, soul, and body, you're filled with spirit. You understand what God's doing today. And thinking along miserable, that, that word miserable is used three times. And again, body, soul, and spirit because they were walking fleshly. Now go to Romans 15. We'll use this to close out the lesson. Romans 15, the rest of the lesson. Romans chapter 15. And look at verse 13. Romans 15, 13, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Notice that now, or well, we're in but now, right now, the, the now part. And you think about 15, 13 there, Romans 15, 13, Now the God of hope fill you. Well, notice when you're filled, you've got a grip on it. You, you're controlled. I mean, the God of hope fill you with what? All joy and peace in believing. And you know, believe, what do we believe? We believe the doctrine we've learned. Paul is writing to the Romans and he's telling them, get a grip on what you've got already. Romans, the first uh, 
14 chapters there in Romans. The first eight chapters talks about the doctrine, believing, believing that. And you get a grip on that and you're filled with all joy and peace. And you'll find there the God of hope there, verse 15, fill, fill you. Well, you know, what, what's that remind you of in advanced doctrine in Ephesians that was written later on? It reminds you of Ephesians 5.18. Well, what's Ephesians 5.18? Be filled with the Spirit. So you're, you're filled. And you think about that. When you have joy and peace in believing, what do we believe the doctrine taught? Like I said, in Romans, there's what is right to them, uh, therefore. You can also put down Colossians 3.16 about being filled with the Spirit. Ephesians 5.18, put Colossians 3.16 down with that. You let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. And then Romans 15, notice that there, uh, 13, now the God of, God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing that you may abound in hope. Notice that abound in it. Well, what's abounding? Well, the doctrine. You're abounding in hope. Well, what's the doctrine? At that point in time, he's writing the letter, it's Romans. That's the doctrine. Abounding in it. The edification process in the Bible starts in Romans, like I told you a while ago. Well, you take all this doctrine and let it consume you. My life and my thinking will change when I do that. Uh, what will be the result? When I, when I, let's take this, for example. When I take the doctrine, I'm saved, I've come to the knowledge of the truth, and I'm, I'm studying Romans 2, 5, and building out a house of doctrine in me, well, what, what's going to be the result of that? Romans 15, 3 talks about the God of, now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. That's, that, that's the, the result of it. Joy and peace. It's gonna, you're going to abound in hope. And that abound means, hey, I'm just going to burst out. It's going to burst out of me. Hey, I'm going to tell you, I'm saved by grace. I'm, I'm looking for that blessed hope, the Lord's appearing, the great God and our Savior. I've got emotions in my soul and that emotions is sound doctrines coming up and that's who I am in Christ. Uh, and you, you think about all that. You know, you think about what God's promised us. Not only this eternal life, you think about all the spiritual blessings in Ephesians 1, 3. You think about the inheritance. You think about who we are in Christ. We're going to be with them forever. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Forever. So, I came to this conclusion everyone, by learning this. Turn to Romans chapter 3 and verse 4. This is the last verse. Romans 3, 4. After, after, after our hope is in God's Word to us, and I, I understand I'm trusting that God's Word is complete, it works quickly, it motivates, it gives comfort, it gives strength, it edifies, it gives hope. Now the conclusion for me is in, in Romans 3, 4. God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written. And I'm going to stop reading right there. That's my conclusion. I, I'm not going on human viewpoint. I'm going on divine viewpoint. And the, the, the divine viewpoint comes from God. God gave His Word. God's not a liar. And every word in there is pure and right. And I, I, I'll stand on the Word of God rightly divided. So our hope's in God's Word to us, for I trust in thy Word. And I, I, I pray that this will be a help to you today.